I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll need you to remind me that I should obey God. That I should obey God. I'll act like I don't have any problems. I'll need you to show me how to share my struggles with others. I'll want to have a lot of money so I can buy what I want. I'll need you to teach me that my things belong to God. That my things belong to God. I'll struggle with my looks and appearance. I'll need you to remind me that God wonderfully made me. I'll tend to think about myself before others. I'll need you to teach me that the last will become first. The last will become first. The last will become first. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll need you to show me how to learn from God's wisdom. I'll want to avoid hard conversations. I'll want to avoid hard conversations. I'll need you to show me how to speak the truth in love. In love. I'll look for happiness in many different places. I'll need you to show me that joy is found in following Christ. I'll find myself stuck in bad habits. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you. I'll need you. I'll need you. I'll need you. To point me toward Christ when no one else will. To point me toward Christ when no one else will. We've been in a summer series on Jesus at home, parenting in his presence. And we've been focusing on things like the value and importance of motherhood, on the importance of seeking to raise our children in Christ and with Christ, on recognizing that what is normal in the kingdom of God and what is normal in the world around us isn't always the same thing, but our goal is to help our children know and love and serve Jesus Christ. Today, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the relationship between a husband and a wife. For you know, the saying goes, and you've heard it before, it goes like this, the best thing you can do for your children, if you're a father, is to love their mother. And it goes the other way as well. The best example children will ever see is the relationship between their parents. But it also speaks to how we're supposed to live in the world because the example we set is supposed to tell people this is who Christ is, this is what it means to belong to the body of Christ. So this is a lesson for everyone. It's called mutual submission. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is trying to get to the end of the chapter and the beginning of chapter 6, in which he's going to lay out the ways that our relationships should look and the ways our relationships should work. And to introduce that whole section, he lists from verse 1 to verse 21 this long intro that begins and ends this way. Therefore, be imitators as beloved children of God. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You heard it said, And you hear it said a lot. Who's in charge here? Who has the power? I remember Sal Yabachella. I mean, if you're going to be the school bully, is there a better name than Sal Yabachella? It's got mafia written all over it. It was only the first grade, but he had ruled the roost since kindergarten. I was the shortest, smallest boy in my class. Sal was the second shortest, smallest boy in our class. But he owned the playground. Someone had to stand up to him. My memory is a bit foggy. I do remember challenging him to some sort of fight. And I remember the teacher walking out. And I remember Sal on the ground holding his stomach as if he had just been hidden, which I would just been hit, which I guarantee you did not happen. And I remember getting into trouble. 
That's all that I will swear to. Four years later, I did it again. He was lording it over the flock, and I was sent by God to teach him a lesson. I was supposed to be the arbiter of justice. So I picked on him to see if, uh, if I could egg him into a battle. Of course, I had no intention of laying a finger on him. I was going to hold my stomach and lay on the ground before any blows were thrown. I never said I was brave, just interested in justice. Every school I ever attended had one of those. The boss, the bully, the one who had to be in charge. Every organization has those. And it's not always the person at the top of the organizational chart. Some say it's natural. Call it a pecking order. That's a great phrase for it, isn't it? You get this image in your head of, of a, a bunch of chickens pecking at each other until they annoy each other so much that somebody gives in and moves so the pecker can have his spot. And if you're not a type A personality or a three on the Enneagram, you may be saying to yourself, listen, I don't need to be climbing ladders. I don't want to be in charge. I don't want to be out front. That's not a lesson for me. I don't have to be the best. I'm sure that's true. We don't, we don't all have to be or even all want to be first. But please, we say, don't let me be last. I don't mind fitting into the broad middle. But there has to be someone or something under me, lower than me, to which I can point and remind myself that that's not me. I'm not at the bottom of the food chain. And when I feel that way, it's natural to pick a fight. But Jesus comes along. And like no leader before him or since that I've ever heard of, he teaches a kind of leadership that is so unnatural. It's counterintuitive. He says strange, in some ways, unbusinessy like things. Like this. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Do you remember the example, the chief example that caused him to say that? It's the very next verse in Matthew 20. He says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, you can go through the New Testament, especially the writings of Paul, and you can find the phrase one another used over and over again. It's used something like 12 or 13 times in the book of Romans alone. Encourage one another, serve one another one another. It's a really important phrase for the way Paul thinks about the body of Christ. How many problems in our world stem from us forsaking we language and replacing it with me language? It's the beginning of the, the warring inclination that pits me against you. But when we live together, when we serve together, side by side, while praying with each other and for each other. Then we're on a path to healing and joy. I have a friend uh, who was my roommate in college named Jeremy Barrier. The first sermon I ever heard him preach, I think he was 16, used this illustration that has stayed with me. He says, suppose that you're on a cruise ship. You're out in the middle of a tempestuous storm and someone falls off the edge. We would plead, we would beg, we would throw things in the water and hope for the best. But if tragedy should strike, and if they be lost at sea, we would mourn their loss, but we would return home and life would continue. 
But now suppose that each of you on that cruise ship were tied to each other and one fell off the edge. The power of our connection would lead to either his life or no future for any of us. Together, a word needed in our world now more than ever. Together. That constant perennial fight to figure out the pecking order was not supposed to be known or mentioned in the community of Christ. We just might do it. Or at least we might just, we might just fake it. We might surrender and submit ourselves to each other for an hour every Sunday morning at church. But where the rubber really meets the road is what we do 24-7 at home. Home is where the power games are often hard at work. And it's where our natural inclination for a pecking order becomes most apparent. But it's also where the supernatural love of Jesus in the fellowship of the Spirit can transform a secular rat race kind of house into a servant-centered home, if we have eyes to see it. You remember the beginning of the story. In the beginning, God makes the heavens and the earth. He makes the skies and the seas and all that is in them and in his power in his wisdom he brings forth vegetation and he makes animal creatures that share life beside us and in his love in his love he makes humanity and the text is very clear and careful here the text says he makes humans in his image not just some humans all humans in his image in Genesis 1.26, most of our Bibles say man, but the word here for man is not the, the, the word for male. It's the word for people. Let us make humans in our image. So God created man, human, in his image. Look at the next verse, Genesis 1.27. He created him, male and female. He created them. It might seem like an odd use of the English language to go from the singular to the plural there. But you see, the translators were trying to bring out the idea that when God chose to have his image born on the earth, he conferred his image in humanity, male and female. The male and the female both show the likeness of God in the same and in similar and in different ways. And this is why God blesses marriage, and sanctifies it. In Genesis 2, Paul, excuse me, Paul quotes Genesis 2 a little bit later. When Genesis 2 says that a man's supposed to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And then Paul in Ephesians 5 says, this is a profound mystery. Now, mystery in Paul does not mean weird. Mystery means a secret that, was un, that has been unrevealed. But now, a great truth, a divine story that's deeper and richer than what you see on the surface is being made known. The two are joined and they become one flesh. Now that's true metaphorically. The two become one family, sharing one name, representing one new unit. But it's also true literally in, in many cases. When the two, as a result of their union, have a child... They literally infuse their togetherness into one new flesh. It's a beautiful image. If you'll allow me to, to wax poetic, it's as if two halves are brought together so the fullness of God can be seen in the fruit of their union. And throughout Scripture, we have this imagery to, to suggest that the fullness of God is best seen when we come together together as a community, producing fruit to the glory of God. Already in Ephesians, Paul has already said in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 that he prays that we'll come to understand the great deep things of God. Chapter 1, he says that you'll come to understand with all the saints 
the height and the depth of the love of God that surpasses knowledge. What an amazing passage. I want you to know that which can't be known. The only way to make sense of that in my mind is this. I want you together to come to know that which no one person in our myopic sense of the world will ever fully know until we do this together with all the saints. The mirror of that powerful truth is seen in marriage. Children see the likeness of God in the fullness of their parents, and parents see the fruitful result of the image and likeness of God resulting from their union of humanity. And if the human is the first biblical portrait of divine likeness on earth, then marriage is the first biblical portrait of true community. This is why in God's good world, in Genesis 1, it's called good seven times. It's called blessed three times. There was only one thing pronounced not good. Do you remember the one thing that when God made the good world said it's not good? That any one person should be alone. Portraits are never complete. And metaphors always break down. If you're an unmarried man or a single mother or a widowed believer or a person without living parents, there's good news for you. The fullness of God is within you and among you. The gift of singleness is celebrated in the Bible. It's celebrated in the early church. The willingness to forsake or forego physical families was actually one of the lines Jesus used when he said, here's what it will take for some of us to belong to the kingdom of God. Let nothing in this lesson deprive you of knowing that the fullness of God is present by his spirit in the heart of everyone in whom he dwells. But models in society and in the church are placed there by God to serve as present reminders of faithful truths. And in the joys and experiences of sacred marriage, the fullness of God is on display. You see, your marriage is a copy or a model of a deeper truth. This is what Paul's trying to say. Paul quotes Ephesians 2, where Adam's talking about Eve, and he says, don't you realize this is really a story that's deeper than you? Nathan and Katie join together. That's just the surface image. The real story in that is Christ and the church. And that is Paul's major reason for introducing marriage into Ephesians 5. The book is about God. Just read chapter 1 and you'll see that this is a story about God. Every major paragraph of Ephesians can be summarized as, this is about God. And as it turns out, that's the subject line throughout your story as well. It's the subject line for the church's story through all generations. The story is always about God. And so when it comes to parenting, parenting is putting on display the glory of God. When it comes to working for others, work is a display of the glory of God. That's Ephesians 6. And when it comes to marriage, Ephesians 5. Paul challenges us to see marriage as a witness to the ongoing relationship between Christ and his people. And that brings us to the question, how does Christ view the way we treat one another? By the time you get to the marriage section of Ephesians 5, the language of worship in community is already in full bloom. Be filled with the Spirit, says Paul, addressing each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to, to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul gives us two 
of those one another passages right here as he introduces relationships. Two of them. One is we're called to sing and speak to one another. And the other calls for submitting ourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you're the kind of person that writes in your Bible, I would encourage you to circle that word submitting in verse 21. And the reason why I would like you to do that is because it does not appear in verse 22. Now, you've got your Bibles open, and you're thinking, Nathan has lost his mind. You know, I love our English translators. I love our English translators for all kinds of reasons. There was a time when the Bibles were in the language that was not the vernacular of the people, and the Bibles were chained to the pulpits. Our translators allowed the Bible to get into our homes and in our homes to get into our hearts and our lives. Praise God for Bible translators. And one of the things they try to do is to make hard things easier by making connections that the writer intended you to make but didn't actually say. One of the ways Greek writers would write or talk is sometimes they would use a verb that was meant to apply to sentences to come without it being actually included. So what it actually says in the Greek is, submitting yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ, wives to husbands. So why why make that big uh, show there at the beginning? Isn't it obvious that wives are called to submit to their husbands? Of course it is. Of course it is. In fact, he goes even further than that. Listen to the way in which he talks about submission. His specific line here is that there's no doubt that wives are to see their relationship towards their husbands the way Christ thinks about relationships between the church and Christ. Listen to this line. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. That's verse 24. And yes, the word submit is there. But I want you to notice this whole paragraph, verses 22 through 24, simply flows out of the first statement in verse 21. It's not a special message for wives. It's a statement about Christian relationships and says, if it's true that as Christ gave himself up for us, and we are to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. What does that look like, wives? Well, it looks like you should be that way towards your husbands. You know where this is going. It means verse 25 does not introduce a new kind of relationship or even a new way to look at a relationship. What he introduces is a similar word. He explains how husbands live out verse 21 as well. And in verse 25, he says, Husbands, if you want to know what it looks like to submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ, it means to treat your wives the way Christ treats the church. We have already know what Christ did. It's listed in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. But he repeats it. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know that passage at the end of, the, of Matthew 5 of the Sermon on the Mount where it says, be perfect? You know how all the, the commentaries try to make that easier for us? And they say, well, the word perfect can also mean complete or total. And so it means complete or total. And you think to yourself, well, I don't feel complete or total. That still sounds pretty hard. But it doesn't sound as hard as perfect. Whatever you want to do with that word, the next part of the verse is meant to remind you that this really is supposed to be a really high goal. Whatever the word means for perfect, the next verse says, as your Father in heaven is that thing. So whatever translation you come up with, be whatever God is, is what he's trying to say. This verse says, husbands, love your wives. Well, love, love sounds easier, sounds more powerful, sounds more meaningful than submit. 
Well, wait a second. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ did the church. And then he explains what that means. What does it mean to love your wife, husbands? Christian love is not rooted in the emotions. Your marriage might be full of deep emotion. I hope it is. But Christian love is rooted in the will. It is our decision every day to do for our family what Christ did for the church. For God so loved the world that he had warm, fuzzy feelings in his heart every time he watched us do whatever we wanted to do. That's not the passage. For God so loved the God-forsaken world. For God so loved the world that had turned its back on him. For God so loved the world that was so rotten, Christ had to die for it. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son. Husbands, love your wives. Not because of what they offer you or even how you see them. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Would you look at the next line? And gave himself up for her. One of the two is going to suffer. Let it be me, says Christ. If one of you is called to lose so the other may gain, let it be me, says Christ. We've got leadership backwards. If sacrifice is called for, let it be me, says Christ. Some people think that leadership is found in taking pride of place and demanding that others go where you point. And if you don't go where I point, you aren't following my lead. In the words of Paul, you didn't learn that way in Christ. Wives, says Paul, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. If husbands were to daily die for their wives as Christ did for the church, the circle would be complete. So husbands, follow Christ in going first. Do the sacrifice. Do the service. Do the honoring and the serving and the loving. Give yourself up for them. Is there a better definition of submission than that? And wives, follow the lead. Together. <coughs> it sounds hard, but it seems easier if everyone plays their part. It's easy to give in to someone who gives in to you. But this is where leadership that models Christ gets even more profound. Husbands are called to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Did you notice it doesn't say because she was holy? Christ saw an opportunity to go first, to lay down his life first so that holiness might result. It is the exact opposite line that every minister and every counselor hears when someone comes with their explanation as to why they're leaving their spouse. So that I might make their life better by setting the example that makes them want more than anything to fall in love with the way I live. Men, listen to this line. The command is to sacrifice to bring about the kind of lifestyle response in others so that they will want to do what they see. Christ gave himself up for his bride to make her holy so that he might present her in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Do we see our wives that way? Pointing out all of her imperfections or flaws is not only beneath our role, it's uh, stupid. Um, if she has wrinkles, who do you think gave them to her? It would be a painful mental exercise to go through the various ways 
her calling to love you has not always been an easy task. And if you read through the section, you'll quickly realize that more time is given to the role of husband than is given to the role of wife. But that's fitting, isn't it? The call to love one another, to serve one another, to give to the other is the basic commandment. And there's more in the New Testament about what Christ did for you than there is about what you're called to do for him. Just as Christ did for the church, husbands, you go first. That's what leadership is all about. And in your marriage, seek to reflect the glory of God or what is marriage for. And then Paul, in chapter 6, moves from husbands and wives to parents and children. In our natural pecking order world, you would think that the line would simply be, children, do what your parents say, period. That's not what it says. I want you to notice Paul has submission and surrender in mind for every participant. Yes, children, obey your parents, but in the Lord... Act toward your your parents as Christ acts toward others. And parents, you don't have carte blanche authority. You're called to give instructions, but only in the Lord, as the Lord would have it. You're not to provoke your children to wrath or anger. Everyone submits to Christ as the true parent and the true model. And then we have bosses and subordinates or literally masters and slaves. In a culture where structural systems were already in place, Christ chooses not to begin with a public policy pronouncement, but with personal character. Christ hates the idea of any person owning another person or ever treating another person as something less than a person. He's against all forms of xenophobia or superiority. But he also plays the long game. Because enacting laws to make illegal for evil people to do evil things doesn't change their hearts and only lasts through one administration. Instead, he calls for everyone in every situation to respond in that situation as Christ would. Yes, servants, slaves, underlings, submit to your bosses, your masters, your overlords. Christ submits. But bosses, masters, administrators, those under your care, those are not yours. They belong to God. And you're to treat them as your boss, as your administrator, as your master in heaven treats you. How long? Until you realize, but wait a second. My master in heaven doesn't treat me like a slave. He treats me like a son. Aha. And that's why when Paul finally writes a letter to a Christian brother who has a Christian slave, he says, in that case, that can't work. You're going to sit next to each other and take the Lord's Supper. You can't leave that moment and treat each other as anything less than complete equals. And so he tells Philemon, here's your slave back, but you can't take him as a slave. He's your brother. Imagine a new world, says Jesus. A new world. The kingdom of God is not about power games. We don't go around asking who's in charge, who gets the power, who's in control, who gets the say, other than how can I be servant of all? I wonder if we would live in that world. I wonder if we'd like to live in that world. I wonder if our wives would respect us in that world. I wonder if our husbands would be worthy of respect in that world. I wonder if children would want to pattern their lives after their parents in that world? I imagine so. For Christ, who is our chief Lord, who is always right and who has complete control, came not to be served, but to serve and to give up his life so that we might be presented without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. May that pattern be true in our homes. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.